I'm David Knowles, and this is Ukraine, the latest. Today, we discuss the most important updates from the battlefront and speak to Yulia Osmolovska, former diplomat and independent consultant to the Ukrainian negotiating team. This hideous and barbaric venture of Vladimir Putin must end in fate. Nobody's going to break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. Every weekday afternoon, we sit down with leading journalists from the Telegraph's London newsroom and our teams reporting on the ground to bring you the latest news and analysis on the war in Ukraine. It's Tuesday, the 24th of May, day 90. And today I'm joined by The Telegraph's defence and security editor, Dominic Nichols, Verity Bowman from our foreign team, and Yulia Osmolovska. I started by asking Dom and Verity for the latest updates from Ukraine. Hi, David. Hi, everybody. The last 24 hours has seen intense fighting continuing in the Severodonetsk pocket so in, in the central Donbass region, this, this lozenge of Ukra- re- Ukrainian territory that is still holding out against the, uh, the encroaching uh, Russian advances from the north and the south. Russia have had significant, a very low level, but significant tactical successes pushing west from the town of Papajna. They've got an operational maneuver group there that, that we've spoken about before, have actually got combined arms maneuver operations working successfully, linking infantry with tanks and air and uh, aviation engineers and so on and so forth. So they, they've, they've pushed west there. Um, this has been the area we've seen Ukrainian forces ceding territory for time, so so giving up a bit of ground in order to prepare either better defensive positions or to give themselves time to to mount uh, more coherent a uh, more coherent uh, counter counter attack. But there is significant pressure there on that on that pocket. If Russia succeeds there and they ca- and they capture that the, the, the pocket of Severodonetsk, it will be it will mean the whole of the, the Luhansk Oblast is um, is in the hands of Russia. Uh, and when we talk about the Donbass, of course, we mean the Luhansk and the Donetsk Oblast. Oblast being there the are 24 regions in in Ukraine, um, split into into oblasts. So the, the, this region of the Donbass that Putin has, has made it clear that that's that's what he wants. As well, he wanted the, the whole of the country, and that that didn't work out after 72 hours. But he seems to now be saying that, that as a minimum, the Don the Donbass, so the Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, is is an absolute minimum for Russia. Uh, in this war. Um, and yes, this pocket is the last bit of the Luhansk, the northern oblast of the two, um, holding out. Uh, we'll talk more about that in, in a moment. But uh, just the other thing to note is that President Biden is in Tokyo for a meeting of the Quad. So the Quad is is America, uh, Japan, India and Australia for an interesting defence grouping. I mean, largely um, created as a as a rebuff to China but obviously has great sway and um, and influence in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so Biden was at, in Tokyo this morning and um, and he was asked about, about the war in Ukraine and he said, this is a quote, this is more than just a European issue, it's a global issue. Uh, so that's an interesting quote because as, as, we've, as we've seen, we were discussing the grain exports yesterday, um, that, that is going to come up again and again and again. This is increasingly having having a, a, a global effect. You know, if you've got one of the the world's largest energy suppliers um, invading one of the world's largest food suppliers. It's going to have a global impact, and we're seeing that in all sorts of places. And uh, the Americans very keen to to maintain that pressure and to and to keep it on the on the global agenda. Suggests it's not it's not just a regional, a European issue, but a but a global one. And I'll take a pause there. Thanks, Tom. Um, Verity, just turning to you, Vladimir Zelensky has spoken about a Russian strike in the town of Desna in the Cherniev region uh, last week. Can you tell us more about this? So the strike actually happened last Thursday. um, But what we now know, thanks to Zelensky, is that 87 people were killed. This makes it Ukraine's biggest military death toll in a single strike in the war so far that we know of. It was done with high provision, um, long range missiles and apparently hit reserve forces at a training centre. But Zelensky hasn't specified yet whether the casualties are military or civilians. Just to take a moment, if we look back at other strikes, the next um, one with the highest death toll is the attack on a train station in Krematorsk. And that killed 52 people in April. Those people were mainly civilians. And I think it's important to remember the attack on Mariupol which was thought to have trapped hundreds in rubble under the theatre, but Ukrainian authorities haven't been able to confirm a death toll yet. 
Thanks, uh, Verity. And just staying on what Dom said about um, food supplies, uh, the head of the UN's World Food Programme has intervened in this. Um, What's he said and why? So the head of the World Food Programme has warned that hundreds of millions of people are marching towards starvation. He said it could be even it could be the worst humanitarian crisis since the Second World War. And I think now we should take a look at how this links to the war. And it's, as Dom said, um, Putin's forces are blocking Ukrainian grain exports. And this is really important because Ukraine is the fifth largest exporter of wheat, the fourth largest of corn and top exporter of sunflower oil. And most of its crop actually goes to developing countries. Um, So Putin has prevented shipments from leaving Ukrainian ports and Western officials say that his army is deliberately destroying agricultural equipment and harvest stores. This actually leaves around 325 million people at risk of going hungry. But what's even more pressing is that around 43 million people are knocking on starvation's door, is what he said. And I think something interesting to look at if people want to learn a bit more about this is we had a dispatch from Somalia early this week speaking to the heart of the issues, which was written by our global health security correspondent, Sarah Newey. So you can go and look at that on the Global Health Security page and you can learn a little bit more about what's actually happening on, happening on the ground in these developing countries. Thanks, Verity. Um, Dom, just wondering if you have any thoughts on this and also um, just if, if, if we could zoom in slightly on uh, the story that uh, Russian troops are attempting to encircle what, what, what we think are Ukraine's elite special forces. If you could just tell us who are these special forces and what would their loss mean for the Ukrainian armed forces? Well, in the Donbass region, since 2014, since Russia's invasion in 2014, Ukraine have got around about 30 to 40,000 troops there. We don't know exactly. Operational security means that we've never never had, a, had an exact number. But um, there's around 10, 11, 12-ish brigades of uh, Ukraine's best equipped and best trained forces in there. And they've been dug in. They've had years, obviously, eight years to prepare these defensive positions. They are, um, they are very very heavily fortified positions. I mean, the loss of any troops is, uh, you know, is, is, is terrible. Um, in, our, in terms of the whole number, I mean, Lulia will be able to, to explain more, but it, the country has, of fighting age males willing to pick up arms, I'm told about 700,000 people have said that they would be prepared to, to fight. Now, of course, that, that ranges from people with, with former military service down to somebody who's never, never held a weapon in their life. But as we've seen from from Russia's approach, numbers do count. So the loss of any troops, um, special forces, or anyone else, would be would be um, very unwelcome from the from Ukraine. However, I was in a briefing yesterday with a um, a, a Western official, and we were asking about this uh, this potential to be to be encircled in the Donbass and and lose lose uh, these fighters. Um, and the Western official said that whilst, and this is his quote, escaping might be desirable, but from a political point of view, um, the Ukrainians might intend to fight. We'd expect to see them fight for every bit of territory they can. And uh, their ability, he said, their ability to launch counterattacks is very effective. We've seen audacious Ukrainian manoeuvres against Russian forces. Um, uh, what he did note, though, was the, the ability to launch larger scale operational counteroffences has been, um, they've been unable to do that at the moment. So, Yes, the the fact that they might be might be encircled and might lose these forces, he said, doesn't mean defeat. They will fight on, and they're performing a vital function, fighting on, even if they are surrounded. So a bit like as we saw from Mariupol, and these forces, uh, although cut off, and they will continue to hold down r- Russian advances. And it is slightly different from Mariupol in that in the, there was there was no way of uh, of resupplying down there really whereas that there are there are more opportunities with the, with the geography and the and the supply lines that Ukraine's able to reach into this into this pocket so yes it would be a blow to lose these lose these forces or have them cut off and have them have to surrender or continue fighting to the end but uh, it would not be it would not mean a um, the operational defeat for that area Thanks, Dom. And as Russia is pushing pushing Ukraine hard in the Donbass, we know that Moscow is also seeing its economic ties uh, with China growing. Uh, this is after being isolated by the West over the invasion. Uh, Verity Bowman, what's happening? What are they doing? Um, so what they're basically referring to is what's been coined in the country as Rus- Russophobia. So as you said, they've been cut off from a lot of Western supplies. 
and what they're doing now is looking towards other options ones that they claim and quote you know come from more reliable countries so sergey lavrov um, who is russia's minister for foreign affairs said that russia must stop being dependent on western supplies so it's now their goal to develop further ties with china so far he said they're expanding economic ties but we don't know the specifics of what this means but china he said had information and communications technology that are in no way inferior to the West, and this could ensure some mutual benefits for both countries. Lavrov said that Russia in future will count only on themselves and countries that have proved themselves reliable and do not dance to some other piper's music. If Western countries do change their mind and propose some form of coalition, he said we can decide based upon that, but for now they are going to look towards mainly China for the future of trade and economic. Thank you very much, uh, Verity. Um, and Verity Bowman, I know I know you have to leave after our update section. So I just ask for your, your reflections and thoughts uh, three months on from the Russian invasion of Ukraine, which of course started on February the twenty fourth. So I just think I'll go and give a little bit back over the con- uh, over the conflict. So when Russia invaded, they were hoping to take over the country in this blitz attack, something they thought would only last a few days or weeks. But it's now in its third month, and what we're seeing is Russian forces bogged down in what's looking like a war of attrition. There's no end in sight, and there's very few successes on the battlefront. The bottom line is that Putin just didn't get the quick victory he expected. Instead, what's really happened is that Russian troops are bogged down on the outskirts of, were bogged down on the outskirts of Kiev and other big cities because Ukrainian forces were able to show strength that Russia just didn't expect. Convoys of Russian armour seemed stalled on long stretches of highway and troops ran out of supplies and gasoline, which meant they were easy targets from the land and air. So then, just about over a month into the invasion, Russia effectively acknowledged the failure of its blitz and pulled back from areas near Kyiv. It announced a shift of focus to the east, like Donbass, which is where Moscow-backed separatists have been fighting Ukrainian forces since 2014. Russia has now seized um, big chunks of territory from around the Crimean Peninsula that Moscow annexed eight years ago. And it's also managed to cut Ukraine off completely from the sea as Azov, finally securing full control over the port of Mariupol after what we saw was a really um, long battle, mainly including the steel plant and the soldiers inside there who refused to give up until the very end. Um, So elsewhere, what's going on at the minute, Russian forces are methodically targeting Western weapons, shipments, ammunition, fuel depots, and the Kremlin seems to harbour a more ambitious goal of cutting Ukraine off from the Black Sea coast. Ukraine at the minute, something we're seeing right now, is that they're getting a continuous and steady flow of Western weapons. Um, So what Zelensky sort of reaffirmed last week was that pushing the Russians back to their pre-invasion positions would represent a victory, but some of his aides have declared even more ambitious goals. Russia, meanwhile, seems, um, you know, to be aiming to bleed Russia by striking fuel supplies and infrastructure and making some military gains in the east. Um, So that's sort of what we're looking at at the moment. Thank you very much, Verity, for your time. Thank you for for coming to talk to us. Um, I'd just like now to bring in uh, Lulia Osmolovska. Um, Welcome. Thank you so much for talking to us. Um, This week is the week of the World Economic Forum's annual meeting in uh, in Davos. And yesterday, uh, veteran US statesman Henry Kissinger had some interesting thoughts about the war in Ukraine. Um, He urged the West to stop trying to inflict a crushing defeat on Russian forces, saying it would have disastrous consequences for the long-term stability of Europe, and said that it would be fatal for the West to get swept up in the mood of the moment and forget the proper place of Russia in the European balance of power. Um, Lulia, as, as an independent consultant on negotiations, what did you make of this? What, what are your thoughts on, on Kissinger's uh, and what Kissinger said? Well, we definitely need to define what uh, is a complete defeat of Russian forces uh, is meant uh, by Henry Kissinger, because uh, we've heard some of the calls of our Western partners that uh, Ukraine has the right to continue with uh, self-defense even on Russian territory, striking Russian military infrastructures. Uh, there are other 
calls or positions uh, that uh, it would be enough for Ukraine just to, to defeat Russia on uh, Ukrainians' territory and uh, regain the control of state border of 1991. Uh, basically, uh, in Ukraine, uh, we understand and interpret these calls of Henry Kissinger as another uh, illustration of a very interesting fe- psychological phenomenon that we observe. For instance, in first months of the war, uh, we saw uh, the... Um, potential fear of our Western partners uh, of Russia winning the war and uh, consequences that it may bring. And right now we see uh, contrary, uh, uh, the opposite. So uh, our Western part- partners seems to be a fear of Ukrainian victory and uh, what consequences this might have for Russia. Uh, so therefore, we just uh, understand these statements as um, the reflection of one of the camp uh, of uh, so-called doves who calls for negotiations with Russia, which we actually uh, don't deny at all. Uh, but uh, the matter is when to start these meaningful negotiations. Do, do you find it... Um frustrating for foreign statesmen and diplomats to sort of be telling Ukraine what they should and shouldn't do. Yes, uh, uh, this is true. Uh, and actually, the reflection of Ukrainian authorities was quite straightforward, that uh, it is up to Ukraine to define uh, when to enter into negotiations with Russia and what to discuss in these negotiations. And actually, this position was supported uh, by UK and US authorities. So this is one camp uh, that we can rely on among our Western partners. And uh, there are obviously quite expected remarks and statements of German, France uh, and Italian leaders uh, calling for these negotiations with Russia at this uh, very moment, because to our assessment, they've been a bit naive uh, trying to understand that uh, uh, Putin could get into meaningful negotiations and uh, there could be a a substance out of it. Again, let me stress, we do understand that negotiations should finish the war, but uh, the point is when to start them. Absolutely. Thank you, Lulia. Um, Dom, I I know you've got many questions. Um, So do you want to jump in now? Yeah, thanks. Um, so just go back one step, if I may. Um, so, Lulia, talk us through the mood in uh, President Zelensky's headquarters right now. What, who's in there? What, what's the kind of daily routine? How is, how is he? How the team? What, what is the mood inside the, inside the headquarters? Well, the mood uh, uh, hasn't changed uh, a lot uh, from what we've been observing for the last couple of months because Ukraine still has this lead in war, at least ecological lead. And uh, actually, the second phase, uh, when we expected Russians to behave a bit differently, um, we haven't uh, uh, seen a lot of uh, success from Russian side. Uh, and uh, this also makes some justifiable expectations that the third phase also could be not uh, up to the Russian expectations. Uh, and uh, time plays into Ukrainian hands uh, these days. So the president uh, is uh, determined to continue with fight. Actually, he's very much hugely supported by Ukrainian population and uh, all his teams uh, working on negotiations track, on military track. And actually, I had to underline that uh, uh, calls for uh, getting back to the uh, state border control of territories of 1991 uh, being expressed not just by the President Zelensky's team and uh, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, but also the the head of military intelligence. So that uh, is another indicator uh, of resolveness of Ukrainian authorities uh, where to go. Thanks. And the, and the question that David asked me a few moments ago, what would it mean for Ukraine if the uh, Severodonetsk pocket and therefore the whole of Luhansk oblast was overtaken by Russian forces? What effect would that have militarily and strategically, um, politically? And thinking about going into negotiations, what, what effect would that have? Definitely, here I could refer to your remarks you made about this, so that, uh, that uh, this uh, doesn't mean a defeat of Ukraine at all. So definitely, this is going to be a very sad um, um, uh, part of, of this uh, warfare, of this campaign. But uh, uh, according to our military experts, we do understand that Ukrainian authorities are investing a lot of efforts and military knowledge into not letting this to happen. Uh, and uh, they are doing something about this. I'm not a military expert on exploring this further, but uh, uh, that means that uh, uh, we need to actually, uh, as I say, uh, when is the point for negotiations? Uh, uh, it's not clear right now uh, how the ser- third phase will be finished and how much of the territory Russians will, hel- uh, will have after this uh, to enter into negotiations. So therefore, we do understand that they would like to get as much as possible just to increase their uh, trade leverage or bargaining 
doing le leverage and negotiations, and uh, obviously Ukrainian uh, armed forces are doing contrary uh, the opposite, trying to get uh, to uh, get uh, regain control of uh, as many territory of Ukraine uh, as much territory of Ukraine as possible. And do you think if they're successful, the Russian forces in taking? let's say Luhansk or Blast, let's say the whole of the Donbass, do, would that be the point, do you think, that Putin will say, right, now let's start meaningful negotiations or... or because his, his force will be exhausted by then. I mean, they're, they're pretty tired at the moment, as we've seen from the very slow rate of advance in recent weeks. But do you think that that, that, will, be, that will be it? He will realise that actually this has been quite a, a tough, a much tougher fight than he was expecting and, and this is the time to claim some sort of victory or, or do you think that, that it will just embolden him and they'll keep going? It's very difficult to uh, uh, analyze at this particular moment because uh, from the one hand, a lot of experts are saying that uh, it's uh, turning to be a political campaign rather than a military campaign because according to military rationale, uh, Russians are not behaving the way they uh, expected to, to behave. Uh, and Putin, uh, it is said, uh, uh, is personally and in control of all these operations, uh, uh, getting into micromanagement. Uh, uh, and also, but on the other hand, we've been uh, started to hear a lot, a lot of comments from uh, military experts in Russia calling publicly from the TV shows uh, that uh, Russians are performing not well and they need to readjust the strategy. And also, it is allegedly uh, two open letters from these military experts written to Putin uh, uh, about the, the situation. So we don't know what the decision will be, but uh, it looks like he is going to get at least uh, these territories of Lugansk and Donetsk uh, oblasts in order to declare uh, at least uh, that mission of so-called special operation has been accomplished successfully. And if that's the case then, and, and negotiations do start, um, how realistic do you think is it that 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 you can talk about the 1991 border or the February 20, 23rd border. Um, you know, Kissinger's comments have, have, have caused a lot of uh, controversy, as, as is the article in the New York Times a couple of days ago. Um, I mean, is it, is it realistic that Ukraine can, in, can insist on ejecting all of Russian forces from Ukrainian territory? Um, well, probably in military terms, it's uh, very difficult right now to foresee. And uh, uh, I do understand uh, the logic of our Western uh, military experts warning that uh, it's not going to be the case. But let me remind you that nobody believed that Ukraine could win this war and uh, could withstand this blitzkrieg in three days. So we don't know actually what might happen um, uh, uh, on the ground, uh, but uh, um, definitely uh, as I say, a lot of Ukrainian authorities, uh, uh, officials are just stating that uh, the success of Ukraine, the victory of Ukraine in this war would be to regain control of the state borders of 1991. That means at least we'll be striving to achieve that. Um, just a question from me, Lilia. As we said earlier, it's the three month anniversary of this war. So you've been doing your job now for, th for three months. The war's been going on. Um, can you give us a sense of how your, how your role has changed or wh what you've been up to um, from the beginning of the war to now? Uh, so uh, the first what we've done uh, from the very beginning of the war was a sort of uh, um, assistance of the military for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministry of Defense in uh, information campaign. So we formed the ad hoc uh, um, informal network of uh, think tanks agent to the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Minister of Defense and uh, uh, contributing on daily basis into this information sharing campaign, doing a lot of public speeches and uh, uh, talking to international media and uh, politicians. And actually, this bared fruit so far already because uh, a lot of uh, comments that I've heard uh, from our Western partners that Ukraine been brilliant on the information side of war. So uh, we even uh, overplaying Russians in this realm. So right now uh, we are mostly doing um, uh, some sort of uh, analysis, uh, uh, policy recommendations and uh, prognosis for the governmental authorities what to do next, especially with regard to the negotiations. And what would you want um, Russian negotiators, presumably, you know, who, who, who will be talking to the Ukrainians, what would you want them to understand about the Ukrainian position? 
The Russian still seems to uh, be following the stereotypes on, on Ukraine and the main problem why negotiations can't be uh, uh, meaningful negotiations can't, can't be launched uh, these days just because Russians are still uh, admit uh, that they can win this war and out of these expectations they are not going to uh, consider seriously what could be done in reality. Uh, once uh, these game changers happen to them and we will see the signs of them understanding or ready to admit that they are losing on the ground, they are losing this war and uh, they are ready to seek for some solutions which could provide them uh, so demanded political face saving so then it will be time for talks i think it's probably the matter of one month or a month and a half and just to sort of expand that question um what would you want listeners from across the west and and also across the world really what would you want them to understand about about how ukrainians are thinking and, and, and how your leadership is thinking at the moment Yes, I want. Uh, we want uh, uh, our Western partners and uh, the general audience to understand that uh, Ukrainians are not just fighting for the land. This is argument I'm always hearing from our Western partners. It's not correct. So uh, it's not about that we have nowhere to go, uh, but it is about the freedom of choice. So a lot of Ukrainians were outraged with the uh, uh, very intention of Putin to insert the, his own government and to teach us how to govern the country. And uh, this is something that still close in hearts of Ukrainians and uh, it forms the decisiveness to fight for our own future. Uh, and the next uh, point uh, worth uh, uh, stretching is uh, uh, stressing is uh, that uh, this is up to Ukraine to decide where to enter into these negotiations. We do understand that uh, our Western partners fear about these consequences for Russia and uh, instability and possibility of using tactical nuclear weapons or some other kind of threats that could uh, be extended onto European continent. But uh, for this we have a uh, good response. We ask you to to provide us with uh, so much acquired military equipment and kits needed for our manpower, which we have in enough uh, quantities, just to fight Russia on our land. And this will be a defeat of Russia and uh, a big humiliation for, for Putin if uh, uh, his forces were forced, uh, are forced out of Ukraine's territory. And this will launch uh, automatically the process of self-destruction in Russia, in Russian authoritarian regime. So this is not something that we are going to create. But this might be the consequences of uh, this war. Tom, I don't know if you want to come in there. Yeah, I'm just interested, Lou, you used the word humiliation there. And that's specifically the word that, that President Macron used when he said that, that, that we shouldn't, that the outcome of this war should not humiliate um, Putin. I mean, he didn't, he didn't particularly go on to expand why especially. But I mean, it, it is a very strong term. And um, do, do you think that is realistic that that you that Ukraine would would want to humiliate Putin and by extension Russia uh, and what are the risks of doing so no, it's not about, again, uh, about a deliberate strategy of Ukrainians to uh, humiliate Putin. It's just the natural uh, consequences of what he's doing in Ukraine right now. So for uh, Putin to uh, n not be able to declare a victory in Ukraine uh, and uh, to admit that he actually didn't succeed here uh, would definitely have an impact of, on his authority within the country, I I among other Russians. And we do uh, see some signs of uh, falling of support to to him in uh, his campaign in Ukraine. So uh, uh, again, this is not something that we would like to uh, achieve as a deliberate target, but this is something which come out naturally just because of the psychological effect of him not being able to win over Ukraine. And in terms of the Western support, the, the flow of arms seems to have got after a, a a bit of a halting start, but the, the flow of arms does seem to be fairly, fairly constant. And we're talking about the right, the right natures of equipment going in now, or some, some of the right natures. In terms of political support, do you think Henry Kissinger's comments were just that they're, they're just of the old world? Do you think now this is the time for uh, to, to decide whether or not brute force should be rewarded in any way, or does? Uh, so the the um, Polish leader came out very strongly in in, in an address to your parliament uh, two days ago, and said that Poland is, is in for the long is in for the long haul and there to support you uh, to to the end. I mean, do you think it's this is the point where small L small D but liberal democracy has to stand up and say say no, we're not going to put up with totalitarian regimes, we're not going to put up with um, capitalist or autocracies. This is just not 
n- it's not good enough anymore. The, the, these sorts of comments about yes, you can you can invade another country and then we'll come to some sort of territorial arrangement. That's that's just old school, and and the world has moved on. Do, do, do you think there is the international will to see that through? I think there should be uh, international and especially Western interest uh, actually to uh, win over Russia in in this war. Um, and Henry Kissinger is well known apologist of uh, this uh, uh, tripolar world, uh, um, U.S., uh, uh, Soviet Union, or uh, Russia's successor and China. Uh, therefore, it was not quite surprising to hear these comments uh, uh, from him. In terms of uh, what uh, does liberal democracies or what they should do these days. Uh, why it is in the interest of West? Because um, uh, with um, making Russia responsible for the actions in unilateral aggressive behavior against uh, the other country, they will set up example for the other hot-headed countries, uh, which also has this imperial appetites towards other countries, just to see the consequences which uh, this behavior might bear for them. And this would uh, uh, cool them off. So this is something which uh, is very important to understand. And uh, in terms of uh, liberal uh, values uh, and small countries uh, having their voices to defend liberal democracies, uh, I see the future not in this kind of trilateral world uh, that of Henry Kissinger, but rather of uh, smaller, more flexible, uh, more mobile, uh, sub-regional security alliances of mixed nature of NATO and non-NATO members. Like, for instance, we can talk about uh, trilateral uh, mm, cooperation of uh, UK, Poland and Ukraine in this example. So therefore I think that we should respond uh, organically and more uh, be more flexible to the current challenges. Can I just ask um, quickly, the uh, Poland's President Duda said that uh, Ukrainians were not refugees but guests in, in Poland. Um, personally, how, how did you react to that? How did that make you feel? Yes, yeah, so that's, that's correct reflection because uh, uh, a lot of Ukrainians are just moving back to the country these days and the inflow into the country uh, surpasses the outflow. Uh, and we already have got more than one million of Ukrainians returned to Ukraine. Uh, and actually, if you just uh, spot the settlement of these uh, refugees, so-called refugees, which uh, flew from the country the, from the beginning of the war, you will see that they mostly settled uh, in the neighboring countries waiting to come back uh, at any convenient moment. So, uh, And uh, as far as, for instance, uh, those people who are placed uh, in Germany or on some other uh, distant countries in, in European Union, I could say that the first thing they asked for when they settled, we want to have a job. We want to earn our uh, money for our livings. So they're not just exploiting the social system of these countries, which is very important. Therefore, uh, Mr. Duda was quite right. We're just guests. We are on temporary basis and we are ready to contribute to the development of the society and community we are in. How do you think the idea from the Lithuanian foreign minister yesterday when he was visiting uh, our foreign minister, Liz Truss, the suggestion of a, of, a, of, a, of a way of breaking the naval blockade, or breaking might be too too hard, but getting, getting through the blockade in order to get the Ukrainian food exports out to the, to the world? He was suggesting there could be some sort of naval coalition of the of the willing, uh, which might might include NATO countries, but he was quite keen to stress it wouldn't would not be a NATO operation. But do you, th- do you think that's that's possible? And do you think it w- would that be welcome? How would how would Russia react to that? I, th- I think it's quite plausible, but there are other options. Uh, uh, still trying to talk Russia into some rationale on this. However, to my assessment, Russia just. Uh, uh, deliberately trying to punish the whole world, uh, which got united around Ukraine in, in this war, and creating artificially creating this food crisis and energy crisis uh, and all our other global crises uh, in the world. Uh, we also heard about the initiative of the president of African Union to have to sit down and have these talks with both Russian and Ukrainian side on this food crisis. So there are plenty of options being considered right now. With regard to this one in particular that you mentioned, uh, it is about about uh, competition of powers. So I think that uh, this would uh, just escalate uh, already a very tense situation in Black Sea. And here I have to admit that uh, Ukrainians were a bit short-sighted on that uh, because uh, we've been talking about these risks of Russia doing this blockade already a year ago or so. And uh, uh, we're calling for Ukrainian authorities to anticipate some offsetting measures for that. And uh, actually we're just uh, uh, paying the price for being a bit short-sighted.
short-sighted. Yeah. And I think um, just to finish off here, what's uh, what's it like in Kiev? People are moving back in, aren't they? People um, are, are going home against the government advice. I think that yeah. is it's right to say that. Um, being advised to still stay stay away. There's a, there's a lot of fighting still, and and missiles are still hitting Kiev. Um, but uh, but but how is it now? Does it does it does it feel different from from the last time we spoke? Yes, definitely it feels different. First of all, Ukrainians also learned uh, uh, from some mistakes in the first y- days of the war, and they've uh, um, m- were more uh, sophisticated in defending the outskirts of Kiev uh, these days, and uh, even the borders with uh, uh, Belarus and Russia, where they can do this. Uh, then we also understand that Russians are uh, running a bit uh, out of uh, their missiles uh, storage uh, because uh, the attacks. Uh, uh, are not um, very of being made very often, so not every other hour or two as it used to be, and uh, so they try to be a bit selective, at least in selecting different cities. And uh, the air defense system of Kiev uh, and Kiev region had been strengthened, so we expect even more to come. So therefore, it's a bit more secured situation, however, not completely. Thanks, Lulia. Just one more question from me. I mean. Is there anything we haven't spoken about that you think you think we should know? You think our listeners should know? No, I, um, actually, uh, you seem to be quite well informed on what's going on in Ukraine. Uh, the only thing I need to convey, probably, just the reflection of Ukrainians towards the UK support, because uh, when we even bring some of UK officials and politicians uh, for U- to Ukraine for different meetings, even ordinary people uh, praise and express their appreciation for the UK stance. So it seems to be that Ukraine is considered to be uh, among the leaders in this support in Ukraine. And this is something that I want to convey to your listeners. To the international audience listening, so we've got a lot of a lot of people listening from the, from the US who have been very forward leaning in terms of money and aims, uh, uh, arms and uh, and political support, and, and elsewhere across Europe. Um, I mean, you could you could, you could be here all day saying <laughs> expressing uh, thanks to those countries. Are, are there any countries that you'd like to see more from? Yeah, we're quite uh, open on that. Uh, we and we are working on that. Uh, is uh, Germany, France, Italy, uh, some other countries might be shown up uh, uh, with the view of considering the Ukraine's application for candidate status. So this is something that we are working on. And but this is just a day-to-day job. So not something surprising. We just need to invest ourselves more into this. Well, thank you so much, Dom, and thank you, Lulia. It just goes for me to ask um, both of you for your final thoughts. What should we be, what should our listeners be looking for um, and paying attention to in the today and the next few days? Well, just one very quick one for me, because I'm, I'm not, at, uh, I don't want to hog it here, but uh, just keep an eye on that Severodonetsk pocket. Um, if, the, if, that, if that falls to Russia, that, there will be a lot of questions asked about what, what Russia does next. Uh, does ne- does next and whether or not that might be an opening for negotiations or whether they all have expended all their best what good equipment they have in theatre to take that pocket so what what comes after that would be uh, would be my observation and i'll leave the last word to lulia yeah, my last word to be uh, uh, will be uh, for our Western partners uh, to be uh, more patient and not to press Ukraine with this uh, necessity of getting into negotiations with Russia uh, at a stage where it's too early. And uh, uh, don't be misled that uh, Russians will be content with uh, this kind of half-made uh, stuff. Uh, just take uh, the example of Chechnya, for instance, when they were defe- defeated in the first Chechen war and they did a huge revenge in a, a couple of years after. So it is about really just to conclude what uh, Mr. Biden said. It's not about just Ukraine. It is about uh, Europe and the globe. And we need to understand these far-reaching consequences of not uh, uh, letting Russia splitting out of responsibility for their actions. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first 30 days completely free at telegraph.co.uk forward slash audio. Or sign up to Dispatches, our Ukraine newsletter, which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. Ukraine The Latest is produced by Louisa Wells and Phil Atkins. And today on Twitter, Sophie Cope.